chilly morning. I uh, got to tell you that I'm from St. Louis. I have a hotel up in Detroit, and this feels like summer to me. <laughs> it's not quite the same. Uh, I've had a chance to come to this great city a number of times in, in, over the years, and, and I've really made some really great friends. Uh, and there's so much basic interest and opportunity in going into business. And I'm delighted to be able to take questions today, to get to know you personally as well, and to uh, explain why this eye is a little red. If, you, if you're looking at it, it's because it's Christmas. I have green eyes, and I let the pupils go red, so I, it's my way of celebrating Christmas. <laughs> no, I, I don't know what happened. I was in the Bahamas at my house just a couple of days ago. I guess I was, you know, touched or hit or... So now it's just what it is. So my apologies uh, in case somebody's really concerned out here about me. I doubt that's the case, but nevertheless. Uh, where do we begin? You know, if I was uh, Henry Ford and I was starting a little over 100 years ago and I asked my, uh, my potential customers, what is it that you would like for me to provide for you? Uh, and that customer back then would have said, help me get faster horses. Think about that. But it was because of his vision and his understanding as an entrepreneur that he realized what he had to do was create this thing called the automobile and begin to move us to the next level. Uh, innovation. Uh, that word is something that we sometimes have a little confusion about. Innovation does not mean that you have to invent something. You see, Henry Ford did not invent the automobile. It was invented in Europe, and he brought it over. But what he did that they didn't do was create an assembly line so that it could be produced at a mass level and at a more cost-efficient level. Uh, that's called innovation. Another definition of innovation, it was a guy by the name of Smith who got a C on his business plan, and he was at Harvard Business School, uh, just to see. But he decided that when he would come out, he would try to pursue his own business plan. Uh, the plan was pretty simple. He took some cardboard boxes, which is nothing new to be invented, and he, he dealt with, he looked at the postal department, which is taking basically one envelope or box from one location to the next. But he created something called Federal Express, which is nothing more than having you fill up a box and moving it from one spot to the next. But he did it in a more efficient way. And therefore, he was innovative. So innovation is the key here. President Obama placed me on the National Advisory Council for Innovation and Entrepreneurship. And uh, there were about 26 of us and we were there for about three years. I sat with the Secretary of Commerce. Next to me was Steve Case, the founder of AOL, the president of MIT, uh, and a variety of other academician types, uh, venture capital types, angel capital types. Uh, and it was really just a couple of serial entrepreneurs like me. And there was only two blacks that were also they were there, myself and the brother who was dean of the business school at Howard. Now, one of the things that I always find is challenging is how our folks lack in understanding or appreciation for entrepreneurship or, or going into business. Uh, and I compared that to history. So I asked him as dean of the business school, out of 100 case studies that your students read, how many of those case studies or about African-American businesses. Now, by the way, if I've asked the same question at, when I spoke at Harvard, at Morehouse, at Texas Southern, uh, at the Kellogg School of Business, I would always ask the same question, stimulates the thought. And the answer was usually, I don't know, or maybe one or two out of 100. So here we have black students wanting to become entrepreneurs, reading about entrepreneurship, or business, or capitalism, 
but it's always about white companies. And then I went over to the black studies side of the school, and I would ask a similar question. Within your black studies, what percentage of your, of your uh, studies relate to black entrepreneurship or capitalism? Yes, they talk about Sojourner Truth, they talk about civil rights, they talk about slavery, a bunch of things. Now you compare that and you ask, well, where's A.G. Gaston's story? Are any of the other black businesses that existed, we could talk a little bit about all of those at the turn of the century, the last century, uh, you know, when we were coming out of slavery and the insurance companies wouldn't insure us, uh, over 62 insurance companies were created. Uh, North Carolina Mutual and, and uh, the American Woodman's, which came out of Texas. Uh, and you've all heard of Golden State, Chicago Met. All of those insurance companies were built because of segregation. And it was interesting, but we don't have any history on it. So I would ask the, the professors, uh, at, 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 at the level of writing black history, you compare that to reading the history that many of us were taught, that I would call, I'll use the term white history, uh, because at that point, that type of history, you would learn about Rockefeller and Mellon and all of those robber barons. They were blended into American history because American history was based on capitalism and it grew from there. But if you compare that to black studies, you saw none of that history. So then I asked, well, why not? They said, well, we can't find any body, and we don't know of any. I said, listen, Black Enterprise for 45 years has been listing the 100 top black businesses. All you have to do is start writing about that. So our students will go out and get educated, but, be, but end up being miseducated as it relates to capitalism. Now, I used to be an entrepreneur, but no longer. I am a cold-blooded capitalist. Yeah. Now, <laughs> cold-blooded in the Rick James sense. Okay. <laughs> now, uh, the 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 concept is this. Some, you know, well, I I was at um, I had a conference at I owned a hotel in in Detroit. I mean, in um, uh, Atlanta, and I hosted the Black Power Movement. So at that hotel, I had all the you know, the brothers and the dashikis here and the, and the Rogans and Tams and black over there and, and the Nation of Islam over here. And I had all the different groups. And, you know, every other word was, you know, black power. Everybody's fist went up. I said, cool. Uh, I was suited. And uh, I would talk about capitalism. Brother, you shouldn't talk about capitalism because that's the slave master imposing on the slaves. I said, no. Brother, know your history. That's slavery. <laughs> Capitalism is when I own something, I want to sell it to you, and you have something, and you wanted to sell it. We're going to compete, and we're going to decide who, I mean, whoever wins, wins, and then you develop capital. You know, entrepreneurship is great because it kind of builds for a, uh, your family, and it allows you to live within a comfort zone. Capitalism, becoming a capitalist, you're building a gen for generational wealth sustainable rate, long-term family and friends and employees to all enjoy the largesse of that business. And everybody grows, and really, in that case, the ship actually rises. So what I did to make a point was here I am at my hotel, the only black-owned hotel in Atlanta, and I had all my staff line up outside. And, and, and then I had a march down the aisle across the front of the podium and back out. And I asked the audience, if you enjoyed their hospitality, show your support. They gave a standing ovation. And as they left, I said, now, that's what you just saw is really black power. It's your ability to employ and make changes in someone's life. And when you do that, now we are really beginning to empower our people. Does that make sense? And so if we begin to turn our minds away from trying to be so indoctrinated in the way in which we're taught and start to open up to realize we have the horizon, that we have everything we want. I'll give you an example. How many of you think outside the box? Raise your hand. Okay, put your hand down. They already know. They heard me. 
I'm going to spank you for raising your hand. I'm going to spank all of you. If you're thinking outside of a box, doesn't that presume that you have placed yourself in a? Oh, don't hurt me now. I know. But you see how your mind goes and triggers into certain phrases and concepts and limitations? And you don't even realize how limiting you are placing yourself. It's like the people who said to Henry Ford, well, give me a faster horse. Well, by the way, you're not going to even need a horse if you have a car. But you've got to understand that that's where we're taking society, and that's where things are going. I, it, it, let me say it a little differently in a couple of different ways. Um, it's how you believe who you are. Uh, if they said to David, you know, hey, David, Goliath is huge. Goliath's response would be, great, that's a bigger target for me. If they said, Goliath is just so tall and you're so short, uh, David's response is, well, he ain't as tall as God. So it's a matter of where your head is. If you're in a boat and everybody's in the same boat, and that's the boat of, of mediocrity, and all you're doing is going to your job and doing the same thing over and over, and suddenly you, you, you know that there's something better for you, but you just sort of sit there in the boat. Well, then I think you've got to learn how to become uh, water walkers because <laughs> you've got to step out the boat on the faith that you have in your business, in your ideas, in your concept. You have to learn how to step out of the boat. Now, when you step out of the boat, the boat may rock a little bit, right? And they're saying, well, hey, wait a minute. You know, you're getting out, you're rocking our boat. That's exactly what I'm doing. I'm rocking your boat. Because now I'm going to step out with my ideas and my thoughts and my vision, and I'm going to pursue them. I wrote the book, Action Has No Season. And that book is, interestingly enough, was written after I had taken three companies public, I, after I had owned about 14 or 15 hotels, 12 or 13 full-power TV stations, a radio station, I built a wireless phone company. Yeah. There's only one black who's ever built and owned his own phone company. And I did that at a point when I had to look at where we were going in, as a society. Because when I started this concept, uh, I realized that we had back then analog phones. You remember the analog phone? The one that would go snap, crackle, drop? <laughs> you remember when the coolest person in the theater was a, somebody with a briefcase and a big phone in that briefcase? And now look what everybody in this room has. You have a digital environment that created digital television, which I learned while I was on the TV business, moving from analog to digital, and said, hey, this phone thing is going to happen. So what did I do? I got into the auctions. And I decided I was going to go for it. And that's exactly what we did. We recognized that it's not about the faster horse. It's not the analog phone. It's now the digital phone, and everybody's going to want one. You're going to give up your horse. You're going to start driving a car. That is what we literally did in 2001 and 2002. We started to consider how to get there. One was auctions at the FCC level. Once we competed and won some auctions, we sold some TV stations to do that. And then once we got to that point, we realized an important factor. And that is we may have to think about how do we brand ourselves. Our own company isn't necessarily the brand that might work in this space, as it would be as we're developing hotels. It's Robert's this and Robert's that. You saw that on the TV, right? Uh, you might ask that question, you know, what is that? Now, remember, I used to be, you don't know this, but when I was elected to office, when I finished law school, I moved two blocks from the projects where I lived for 10 years, and I represented the hardcore portion of St. Louis in the projects. Uh, and I was elected. I served for eight years. And I got to tell you, the experience is quite rewarding and quite challenging but you had to be all right with the brothers and sisters in order to get elected. So like I told a group last night, don't let this light skin fool you. I got street cred. <laughs> now, 
So, <laughs> so I got to tell you this story. <laughs> Let me tell you this story. I'm young. I'm in my 20s. I get elected. And uh, uh, Scruggs CME Church is, is a block up from my street on, 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 in St. Louis. And uh, there's this new pastor who shows up. A new pastor comes in. And uh, I get a call from him. And the pastor calls me. And, and I introduce myself. He says, Yo, I know who you are. I said, great. He said, well, listen, outside of my parish hall right here is a dead dog. I, I, I'm an elected, I'm an alderman, I'm a legislator. Uh, I don't deal with dead dogs, right? So, but because you're an alderman in the hood, you better respond to anything. I don't care what it is. <laughs> so I said, well, Pastor, it's my understanding. He said, listen, uh, here's the phone number for Humane Society. I'm sure they'll come and get your dog. Yeah. He took the phone number, and about three days later, I get a call back from this pastor. And uh, he says, uh, young alderman, I think you need to come up here and see me real fast. And I'm busy, but, you know, okay, fine. I, I go up, and he walks me out, and he points down. He says, you see that? What is that? I said, well, Pastor, it appears to be a dead dog. And he said, that's right. He says, and then he went on to say things that I thought religious people don't, words that they don't use, you know, uh, a few four-letter words that I didn't, I was, I was surprised. Um, but being, you know, a little responsive on things like that, I responded by saying, well, Pastor, wait a minute. Uh, I thought it was the responsibility of the clergy to bury the dead. So, so, so that was my response. And, and he looked at me and he said, <laughs> he said, yes, young alderman, but it's also my responsibility to contact the next of kin. Anyway, so I digress. My apologies. <laughs> but, uh, you know, when, when, when building this wireless phone company, we got into some really interesting challenges. <laughs> the biggest challenge was trying to figure out how you're going to pay for it. Because at the time, uh, we worked our way to Sprint. We discussed the possibility of being an affiliate of Sprint with our licenses. They first said, no, we're only going to allow uh, an affiliate. Now, they had built the big cities by this time, spent $10 billion. But all the rural areas had not been built. And that was going to, of course, have to get built eventually, if the infrastructure. That's what we held license, about half the state of Missouri. I flew over with my team. We had about 10 of us. Uh, we flew in my private jet. And it was, it was you know, I'm, I'm now like, hey, you know, I'm a bad boy. And then they looked at me and they said, well, yeah, you're bad. But right now, we're only dealing with rural phone companies, and we're going to affiliate with them and give them the opportunity to do the cellular relationship while they have the wired phones, well, wired phone lines. I said, no problem. At some point, I said, listen, I built TV stations. To build a phone company, you basically have a base station, a tower, and an antenna, and it sends signals. I said, in the TV business, you have basically a transmitter in a building, a taller tower, and you send a signal. Now, that's a microcosm reflecting this macrocosm. And here are the engineers I have from Chicago, all these brothers that were ready to jump into the business. It's that early in the industry now. And uh, they said, well, we're impressed, but we're sorry we, we won't be able to do anything with you. I said, well, I'll tell you what. Uh, in this business is first to market. Whoever gets there first wins. I'm going to start building without you, and then you can, you can follow me if you like. He said, well, we'll stay in touch. A month later, they called me. Would you like to have dinner? We'll fly to you. <laughs> and with that, uh, quite literally, this is what happened. Uh, they flew in. They said, we want to give you the, whole, give you the whole entire state. Here's a map. You design whatever you want. So we took the whole state in southern Illinois and a little Oklahoma, everything that touched Missouri. And, uh, and now here we are. We, we, we've, uh, well, in my book, there was an article that sort of described this whole story that was when we were written up in Forbes. And the heading of the term of, of the article was fake it till you make it. <laughs> uh, and, and I remember the partners I ultimately had, they would ask that question, what does that mean exactly, fake it till you make it? I said, well, let's put it this way. Uh, in your world, you have a thing called dress for success. We, call, we just call it fake it till you make it. 
Y'all got voodoo economics. We call it fake it till you make it. I said, it's a cultural thing. Relax. Don't worry about it. <laughs> One of the questions was, how do you raise initially the first $110 million to build this? And I was asking other colleagues, how did you get your financing? Most of them already own phone companies, but they're building the wireless digital network as well. And, I, and we, what we found out was I'm sitting at a, an affiliates event in Colorado sponsored by Lucent, and I asked one of my guys, I said, how, how are you financing this thing? And by now, because you're affiliated with a Sprint versus on your own, you had the buying power, which took us down to about $54 million, as opposed to almost 100. But the industry was changing rapidly. Prices were going down. Associated, associated relationships made the difference. Now, here's something for those who may be in business at some point in an area similar. Not necessarily the phone business, but you'll get it in a second. So I asked one of my colleagues, how did you finance this thing? Because I know everybody in this room is going to ask me the same question. How do you finance things? I don't know. And they said, uh, vendor financing. I said, interesting, vendor financing, what's that? He said, that's when the vendor that you're buying your items from finances your deal. And I said, interesting. Well, Nortel and Lucent were battling all over the country to get the rights to certain markets. Nortel had already built St. Louis and Kansas City for Sprint, and they assumed I was going to have to do business with them because there had not been interconnectivity between uh, the, the platforms for Nor Nortel and Lucent. So what would happen is if you're driving down the highway and you're on a Lucent um, signal and you cross over to a Nortel signal, you get dropped. Well, of course, eventually technology opened up for it to be, you know, you, you, you had no dropping at all. So I talked to the Nortel people. They said, well, we'll give you a one-for-one -one loan, meaning... For every dollar you put up, we'll put up a dollar. It's 25 million, didn't have that. I went to Lucent, I said, how'd you like to control the backyard of Sprint? Sprint's based in Kansas City, that's Missouri. Kansas City, Kansas, that's Missouri. And they said, how do we do that? I said, you work with me and I'll do the deal, but I need financing from you. And they said, well, let me look into it. They came back and they said, Man, we'll, we'll, we're going to finance you with a whole $54 million. We're going to loan you all of the money. And, and we're also, there's a, there was an area in Jefferson City that uh, had been built that we were taking over that had Nortel equipment. But they said, we'll give you the other 23 base stations to change out, kick out the Nortel equipment and put in our equipment free of charge. I said, well, all right then. <laughs> I can live with that. So, so I give you these stories only to let you know that there are very strategic moves that you can make. Uh, and in my book, I write a lot about the philosophy of being in business. And a lot of the stories I, I, I've just described, this story and others, are also in it. Uh, but one of the things that we have to recognize is uh, you don't make your dreams come true understand what I'm going to say. The person next to you make your dreams come true, not you. And so what's the first thing you have to do if you have a dream or if you're dreaming? You got to wake up, right? <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to sit up and then you have to stand up and then you have to realize that I have this dream, I have this vision, I have this passion, I have this interest. And if I don't go after it, nobody else will. But then there's going to be, you know, Aunt Lucy's going to say, well, you know, now Tyrone tried to start that thing called business, and it didn't quite go any place. And you're going to have the naysayers that are going to be there kind of telling you why you shouldn't do it. Well, after you wake up and sit up and stand up, sometimes you've got to tell your family to shut up and get out of your way because you're going to step out of that boat. But what they don't realize is you know where the stones are. And when you walk on water, like I said, you're going to rock the boat getting out. But man, sometimes we just need to rock the boat, don't we? And we need to 
make that a part of our life is we have this fear. And I submit to you, what would your life be like if you could eliminate the fear of failure? Think about that for a moment, the fear of failure. How many thoughts and ideas do you or you know someone who had this great idea and two or three years later somebody else is doing your idea and making millions of dollars? So let's get rid of that. How do we get rid of it? Let's first define it, break it down. First word, fear. Fear is just a mental construct. It's not one of those plants or the wind. It is, it is not of substance. You follow me? It's a mental construct. When you were born, you were born perfect. And you had no fear. Fear creeped in. It creeped in like that obnoxious cousin who came to visit you one night to spend the night and would never left for a month or so. But you can get rid of fear. Today, let's just eliminate it. Second word, failure. Every day when you wake up, you're given 86,400 seconds. That's 24 hours for you math majors out there. Uh, and when you go after your life experiences, uh, you may end up in a divorce. Ladies, sometimes you may find that the men are just not right. And brothers, I know y'all find that the women are not right as well. Your business may not have been successful, but from all of those experiences, didn't you learn something? And if you learned something, it wasn't a failure. It was an experience where the outcome wasn't as you would have liked. So there's no such thing as failure. They're just these experiences that you have in life. And having had those experiences, you'll find that even in, as we go through business, you know, we have to build our business in a way that's different than what we're sometimes told or thought. If you have a brand, you don't send your brand to follow other brands or, or some great development that's out here and you're going to go and try to develop at that development. No. You don't want to chase the development. You want a development to chase you. You see, you want to reverse a lot of the thinking that you have today. You want to be the entity that people will emulate and pursue. And like I said, back when I was in the hood and I was building my companies and the brothers were asking, uh, you know, you keep naming this after your family name, Robert's this and Robert's that. And, um, and they said to me, well, what is that, some kind of ego problem you have? So I looked at them and I said, look at man, we have to build images for our people. There are a lot of ways to do it. But, a lot, but one of the better ways is for us to be identified as who we are, be seen, and then get it out there. So, my friend, what you might consider to be ego, you know, what I'm hearing from you is envy. And you need to quit drinking and stop being envious and start understanding the value of who you are and start to build around your purpose. And we all have a lot of purposes. Don't think that one business is the way to go. Uh, somebody sent a, a, a question in that relates to multiple streams of income. You heard all those different businesses. Most of those are established because when you start one, it takes a while for that one to go. So why not start a few more? Because they all take time. I mean, if I'm a farmer, I mean, if I plant only corn, when I could plant collard greens, kale, you know, pumpkins, and, 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 and name something else, spinach. <laughs> if I have a farm where I can plant multiple seeds, why wouldn't I do that? Why would I just rely upon corn and only to find that this season is the worst season in history for corn, and then what's going to happen to me and my business? Well, I have nothing left, right? So same thing is true with multiple levels of income. 
you know, you, you, you'll find, I'm sure, in today's room, there's probably some folks who may have some ideas. Uh, we may hear some very interesting uh, points of view. And we may hear some that are looking for some assistance. Uh, we may find a re retired accountant who could assist someone in the bookkeeping of their, of their business. I'm just giving examples. Uh, I don't know what's, what's here. And we don't know what may come of this meeting today. But I do know that something will come of it. Uh, and, and that's what I find to be the most exciting part about visiting a city and, and meeting with our folks. You know, if you have succeeded, then share a little knowledge if you have it. Uh, you know, we always hear the, the term or the concept that there's probably a cure for cancer, but it's probably in a cemetery someplace because it never came out, that idea, that, 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 that sense of purpose that that person may have had never developed it for whatever reason. So if we look at our schools and we start there and we start to push the question of why aren't you teaching our kids more about success stories as it relates to capitalists and entrepreneurs? Why don't we show that the, the real power in this country and actually the world, because now we're so global, is how do we find the types of goods and services that people need all over the world? You know, we, we don't need to think small anymore. We need to think large and globally and, and, and make, the, make the entities that are looking for the types of things you offer come to you, whereas you don't have to go to them. Marketing is important, but, but really truth is the most important part of marketing. Make sure that your products or your goods or your services really are top drawer. If you come to my hotel in Detroit, Roberts River, you've been there. The Roberts River, I'll let you give testimony in a second. Uh, <laughs> that's what you call truth in marketing, right? <laughs> when I went to Detroit to buy this hotel, it was in 2010. The mayor had been indicted and was off to jail. The city was about to face bankruptcy. People were walking away from a great city. Uh, you had so many different reasons not to go to Detroit, including I had a call from a friend of mine who was, worked for the governor in economic development, and he suggested I don't even come to his own city, and he's in charge of economic development. Your, your purpose has to get past a lot of the smoke, and you have to look clearly and see what you have. Now, this property sits directly on the Detroit River. You walk out the door, you see beautiful boats passing. You see Canada on the other side of the water. Uh, it's a very strategic location. Omni had the hotel, and they decided they were going to close and board it up because they just couldn't figure out how to do business, in my opinion, with black folks. I mean, honestly, I think then when it was all said and done, they were trying to make, it, make a community that didn't exist. Uh, so I bought it. Uh, I negotiated hard, and I was able to write a personal check. And that shocked them, but it also, you know, made them swallow a lot of more money that they wanted from other people who had all these contingencies. But I tell you what, you know, money talks. And we were able to, you know, step in. I bought it. It was boarded up. I took the winter. It was bought in December. I took the winter and renovated the property, made it look great, uh, then opened it up in the, uh, in the spring. And once we opened it, it started rolling. Now it's difficult to start a hotel over and to create what it takes. But what I knew was that I was in a location that was gonna keep rolling up. And now I must get it off for a week or uh, somebody kicking a tire, white folks wanting to buy my nearly four acres that sits right on the water. And uh, it's okay, and I'm a businessman. You know, you, you offer the right amount, and uh, that'll be fine. I, I'm the, being the largest developer in the Bahamas, African-American developers, I would just go down there and keep, uh, keep building down there, especially since Trump is the president. 
I mean, no, I mean, I didn't say that. I'm sorry, I didn't mean. <laughs> how many? How many of you say, "Well, I'm going to Canada. I'm going to Africa." I'm go <laughs> but at any rate, um, no. I mean, you know, you 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 feel comfortable with knowing that you are in business and don't fall in. My point is, don't necessarily fall in love with your business or who you are. Don't fall in love with that. Realize that you can, if you can sell it and make a substantial profit, do it because you have other things to do too. And you need the money to do it. So feel free to, to step out and, 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 and allow yourself to explore all types of wonderful business opportunities that's out here. OK. So listen, I can really talk for hours and share all of these business stories because there are so many. Uh, from a family standpoint, I was just happy to say that uh, uh, you saw my mom and my dad uh, Briefly on the screen, you may not have noticed, my dad was standing there with my brother and I. He just turned 94, still drives, uh, sharp guy. Uh, my mom's 88, and next year they'll celebrate their 70th wedding anniversary. Wow. Yeah. Uh, and it, it's great. I have four children, and all four of them have finished law school. Uh, and I'm proud of that because no matter how many millions of dollars or hundreds of millions I've made or all the things. The key is you just judge me on how I raised my babies. Because in our beliefs as black people, family is what? First, right? And so although we always have family members who have issues, uh, we understand that. Yes. And I have them and you have them. So, you know, <laughs> nobody gonna play dumb with me today, you know. So we, but we, we, we recognize those kind of things and we work through them. Uh, you know, I, I had a chance to go to Ghana and, and, and visit the slave quarters. And there's an opening there's a, that goes out, and, and the term on top of it, it says, the door of no return. And uh, it, it, it really is uh, heart-wrenching, in a sense, to realize that several million of our ancestors passed through that door and similar doors throughout uh, Western Africa. And we just have no clue as to from whence we've come and what it's all about. But the good side that I mentioned the other day is that you have DNA that goes back to the origin of man. Which country had the first, reportedly the first human identified? Africa. At that point, you received a DNA trait that's passed on to who you are today. Millions of people copulated to create you. Uh, I use the example that how is a Michael Jordan, whose parents were like this tall, become the, one of our greatest basketball players in history? What is that? How does a little four-year-old kid get on the piano and, and start playing Beethoven and, and Mahler and Amazing Grace? Four. That's a DNA component of who you are. What is your DNA? What is your strength? What makes you unique? And you know you are. And you've got to realize that the, the first DNA that created you was our father. Because if, if the concept is that the origin started, and I don't care if you believe in the amoeba or atomy, it doesn't matter. Realize that you have a DNA strand that comes from the origin, which means that any spirituality that you have is already inside of you, not out here, but it's within you. So it's up to you to dig deep and pull that strength out. It's those, that inner voice that tells you at night and you're on a dark street crossover because danger is around. You don't see it, you just feel it. And what you have to do is realize that in business, you have empirical knowledge, which is where you go to school and you have people who teach you things. And then you have instinct. And you must be in touch with both. Because sometimes it's just that gut reaction that says, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this business thing and I'm going to make it work. And I know I can. And it may be that everybody else just don't see it. I mean, trust me, my daddy worked at the post office for 39 years. The hotel that I owned in St. Louis 
at one point didn't want blacks to deliver mail to the hotel. But then I owned the hotel. And you saw the theater, which was next door to it. You know, at one point they didn't let blacks in. Eventually they let you sit in the nosebleed section. My mama told me the stories. So we went and bought the theater. <laughs> That's what we could do. That's our form of recovery and putting ourselves back to where we should have been all along. You know, we are of royal blood. We have that. That's within you. That's within your DNA because you are just that strong an individual and that smart with those instincts. So let's make the most of it. So at this point, uh, I want you to know that there's the word that I invented. It was called the action air. It's in the book. And it's a, the action air is defined as one who takes their ideas, their dreams, their vision, and their passion, and they pursue them with courage, with confidence, and with bravado. An actioneer is a no-box thinker. An actioneer has eliminated the fear of failure. An actioneer realizes that, that that person, she does not make her dreams come true. You make her dreams come true. You follow me on that point? So we have to be actioneers. Uh, let's get that in the dictionary, by the way, yes. because usually yes. the black invented words that go in dictionaries are words like bling bling, <laughs> you know, or bootylicious or something like that. You know. <laughs> and and, and uh, why don't we have an intellectual word for change? <laughs> let's get out and, and, and let's, go to, let's talk to our, sco our, our schools about, you know, promoting more of the right type of history that relates to capitalism, black entrepreneurs, et cetera. Because until the kids can see more of that, they can't realize that it's actually possible. So we have to get more of us to, to step up and step out. And I'm hoping that all of you here will do just that in your own way. Just keep pushing that issue at home. Thanksgiving is there. You, you know, just talk about, hey, what kind of businesses can we deal with? I spoke to some senior citizens yesterday about four or 500, maybe 600. And I said to them, I said, listen, this is the one time in your life that you are actually free. You no longer have, you know, the house note. You don't have the kids. You don't have the job requirements. You're free. You're freer now than you've ever been, but you're also smarter than you've ever been. You have a little more money than you've ever had, this extra. You have a little money that may be coming in. And think of starting a business. Why not? What are you waiting for? Don't you know people who need uh, a caregiver that can pay you a little money and you can do some things around the house and help that person as a business or as a volunteer? I said, what about setting up a business that deals with babysitting the single, the mom who's single with a baby who's looking for a job but can't get out and do anything because of the child? And you're the senior with all the experience of taking care of babies and looking out for families and things like that. There are so many opportunities for you to just embrace and make your life just a little nicer and happier and more fulfilling. I mean, it is just something that you can do.